And thank you for the kind invitation, Anish. Let me share my screen. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. I, I feel like I'm with uh, uh, friends and family and uh, many uh, of uh, THI achievements and outstanding work is uh, familiar with me. Uh, I'm very familiar with. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to be discussing uh, is something that may be bread and butter for many of your outstanding interventional cardiologists. But this uh, topic or this lecture, I'm going to gear it towards the clinical cardiologist as well as the interventional cardiologist. Uh, I have no uh, relations with industry or uh, conflict of interest related to this topic. Uh, I was a member of the writing uh, uh, group of the uh, guidelines, ACCHA, Viral Heart Disease Guideline. And this topic will cover the issues related to aortic uh, stenosis as well as TAVI versus SAVR. Uh, so that's my focus for the current grand rounds. I also was a member of the 2017 focused update on the Viral Heart Disease Guideline. Uh, and I was a member of the team that performed the initial uh, TAVI at, in the whole uh, VA healthcare uh, in 2011, a few weeks after the FDA approval. And uh, just, uh, I was a uh, member of the team that we just started at Harris Health at Bantob, also the first uh, TAVI program uh, this year. Uh, so TAVI and aortic valve is at the core of my interest. And I would love to share with you some intricacies related to our viral heart disease guideline, uh, as well as contrast some of our guideline recommendations with the recommendations from our European colleagues. So you're all familiar with the guideline uh, recommendations uh, uh, by ACC and AHA. Class one recommendation, and these classes of recommendations are based predominantly on the ratio of benefit to risk. This is obviously separate from the level of evidence. So class one recommendation is a strong recommendation to do or implement a strategy because the benefits way outweigh the risk. Class three, as you may know, there's either no benefit or even there's harm. That's why it should not be done as class three recommendation, either for no benefit or because there's actual harm. Class 2A and 2B recommendations are really a borderline. So class 2A, there may be, uh, there is benefit that outweigh the risk, but the uh, magnitude of benefit is not the same as in a class one. With a class 2B, there may be benefit. So it may be reasonable to implement the strategy. So let me start with a clinical case of a 66-year-old man uh, who's been having progressive dyspnea exertion and fatigue, BNP 310, known to have poorly controlled hypertension, two prior surgeries, one cabbage and one other prior mediastinal surgery. STS PROM score is in the intermediate range, 6.5%. And echocardiogram showed a normal LV function, mild LVH, and all three measures uh, indicative of severe aortic stenosis. So a velocity across the valve more than 4.1 meter per second, mean gradients more than 42 millimeter, and aortic valve area of 0 0.9 millimeter square. This is a still images of the CAT scan of this patient. To the left panel, you see this uh, calcific uh, tricuspid aortic valve. And to the right, you see a cross section across the uh, left ventricle. Uh, it's not the best image, but a hint of mild or left ventricular hypertrophy. And I want you to focus on the apex and think what's happening at the apex of the left ventricle of this patient. And I'm going to go back to this patient at the end of my uh, uh, talk. So let us start with a simple uh, uh, questions uh, that are really uh, more geared toward the cardiology follows and the clinical cardiologist. According to the Vulvar Heart Disease Guideline, we published in late 2020, December 2020 by ACCHA, what should this patient have? Should he undergo an exercise stress test? Should he have optimized blood pressure before treating his AS? Should he have an aortic valve calcium score measured, receive a follow-up echo in six months, or undergo aortic valve intervention? You're all familiar with the stages of valvular heart disease. At risk, uh, uh, valve disease would be a patient like having bicuspid aortic valve who's at risk of progressing to more significant aortic valve stenosis and disease. Progressive aortic valve disease would be somebody with mild or moderate 
uh, aortic stenosis. Then you have stage C, which is asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. And we divide those patients into asymptomatic with no LV or RV decompensation. So the normal structural uh, LV function uh, and RV function. So EF usually more than 50%. C2 is asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. I'm talking here about the aortic valve, but with decompensated LV or RV, usually with EF less than 50%. And we have obviously the stages D, which are the severe symptomatic uh, valvular heart disease. And in the case of aortic stenosis, we classify them into D1, D2, and D3. So D1 is symptomatic severe, high gradient aortic stenosis. These patients are able to mount a velocity more than four meter per second and the mean gradient above 40 millimeter. And they usually have an aortic valve area typically less than one centimeter square or index aortic valve area less than 0.6 centimeter square per meter square. Their symptoms are anywhere between heart failure, exertional angina or exertional syncope or presyncope. But really the most common symptoms in these patients are exertional dyspnea, dyspnea exertion and exertional fatigue and progressive decline in their functional activity. Stage D1, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, is very easy to diagnose. Now the challenge is with stages D2 and D3. So D2 is also severe aortic stenosis, but these patients have compromised LV ejection fraction, less than 50%. They're unable to mount a gradient or velocity more than 40 millimeter or four meter per second. And uh, you would wanna perform the dobutamine stress echo up to 20 mic uh, per kilo and try to elicit if they have a like, contractile reserve and increase gradient and velocity across the aortic valve and discern through aortic stenosis from pseudo stenosis. Stage D3 patients is even trickier to diagnose because these patients do not have low EF. These are uh, severe aortic stenosis with paradoxically low for low gradients because their EF is above 50%. However, they have paradoxically low stroke volume index defined as stroke volume index less than 35 cc per meter square. And again, they cannot mount appropriate or, or adequate gradient or velocity. And uh, it's trickier to diagnose these patients. You may need to resort to adjunctive diagnostic modality like aortic valve calcium score. You will need also to optimize their afterloads and their, their blood pressure uh, to increase their stroke volume to be able uh, to better assess the severity of their aortic valve. Uh, so let's go back to this patient. Should we perform an exercise stress test on the AS patients and when? So in asymptomatic patients, truly asymptomatic patients who have no decompensated LV function, so normal EF above 50%, exercise testing is reasonable to assess physiologic changes with exercise and to confirm absence of symptoms. And in the guidelines, we say if you have symptoms on exercise, even you're asymptomatic without exercise, I mean, symptoms on exercise stress test are symptoms. Even if in routine daily life activities, the patient is asymptomatic, once you elicit symptoms on stress test, then you'd consider this patient as a symptomatic patient who needs aortic valve intervention. Obviously, if the patient is severe symptomatic with stage D1, with high velocity, high gradients, then you should not perform an exercise stress test because of the risk of sudden cardiac death and ventricular arrhythmias. So in this patient, absolutely no stress test. Now, what about the role of medical therapy in this patients? Now, blood pressure control in patients with the stages uh, B and C is appropriate as long as it's done very carefully, cautiously, and careful titration. Uh, if you wanna use antihypertensive therapy, the guidelines really do not indicate preference for one versus the other, but there are some retrospective data showing that blocking the uh, renin angiotensin system, uh, system with ACE inhibitor or ARB may impart a benefit. And in retrospective studies, there are some benefit in on all cause mortality, probably because of the beneficial effect of ACE inhibitors on limiting fibrosis and left ventricular hypertrophy in these patients. Now, statin therapy obviously uh, is shown in multiple, in at least three randomized control trials that it does not impact the progression of aortic stenosis and uh, it does not reduce aortic valve related events. Now, in the clinical studies of AS patients, 
it does reduce by around 20% or so ischemic heart disease events in patients with aortic stenosis. Oftentimes, AS patients are older, they have a high atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk, and they need statin anyway. But it's not recommended for the lack of benefit to give it to prevent the progression of AS. That signal of benefit uh, was evident in early observational retrospective analysis, but did not pan out in randomized controlled trials. So what about measuring calcium score in this particular patient? Remember, this particular patient was a stage D1, straight diagnosis of high flow, high gradient AS with symptoms. So really adding aortic valve calcium score does not help much because you already get your diagnosis. Now, adjunctive diagnostic modalities, uh, such as a aortic valve calcium score may help in those with diagnostic dilemmas, like those with stage D2. Uh, let us say you did a DSE on them and you're unable to elicit a contractile reserve or increase their gradients because it did not increase their uh, cardiac output by more than 20%. Or in stage D3 uh, with a low stroke volume index and you're not sure whether the symptoms are at, this is true severe AS or not, then you could measure an aortic valve calcium score. And there's six specific Agatson scores uh, so for women, we go with a threshold of 1,300. For men, we go with a threshold of 2,000. Remember, in the women, uh, they may have severe aortic stenosis with less calcification because they're more prone to fibrosis of their aortic valve. While in men, there's more predominant calcification as contributing to the pathophysiology of their senile aortic stenosis. Now, what about following this patient with echocardiogram? And this patient had severe symptomatic stage D1. He needs to have aortic valve intervention. But let's say if he was uh, uh, asymptomatic or stage B, then the recommendations are as follows. For those with mild aortic stenosis, you would want to follow with a transthoracic echocardiogram every three to five years, moderate aortic stenosis every one to two years, with a true stage, true severe asymptomatic with compensated LV function more than 50%, i.e. stage C1, you wanna follow every six to 12 months. Now, if they have severe asymptomatic stage C2, then even if they're asymptomatic because of the structural deterioration in their LV function, they would need to go towards aortic valve intervention. So this patient should go undergo an aortic valve intervention. So that was a simple question just to start the discussion. Now, in our guidelines, we published a little bit more than a year ago now, we have five class one recommendation to treat symptomatic and, asymp to treat symptomatic and asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. Three for symptomatic severe AS patients. So class one recommendation with the highest level of evidence for those with a stage D1 who have symptoms of exertional dyspnea, heart failure, angina, syncope or presyncope, aortic valve intervention is indicated. Now for those symptomatic who are stage D2 or D3, so low flow, low gradient, with reduced EF or preserved EF, then it's recommended also to uh, proceed with an aortic valve intervention. But here you may face some diagnostic challenges to really ascertain this is a true aortic stenosis and different from pseudo-aortic stenosis, and also to ascertain, at least in stage D3, that the symptoms are related to the aortic stenosis and not related to something else. Now, for asymptomatic patients, we have two class one recommendations. One is to perform aortic valve intervention in asymptomatic stage C2 patients with severe AS. So those with severe AS, even they're asymptomatic, but have an LV function less than 50%, already had a structural heart disease or deterioration of the LV function, they need to go with an aortic valve intervention. Those asymptomatic with severe AS who are already undergoing cardiac surgery, it makes sense to go with surgery concomitant SAVR in addition to their cabbage, for example. And that's a class one uh, recommendation based on non-randomized data. So regarding the timing of intervention, it all depends on the symptoms. So, if the patients have symptoms and they have stage D1, then you go for aortic valve intervention with SAVR or TAVI. If the patient have symptoms, but they're unable to mount a velocity more than four meters per second, and the diagnosis is unequivocal, then you go to assess the LV function. If they have EF less than 50%, these could be stage D2 or could be a pseudo-aortic stenosis, pseudo-severe aortic stenosis, then DSE 
to try to elicit an increased gradient would make sense. And if there's contractile reserve and the gradient above 40 or Vmax above four is elicited, then you go with aortic valve intervention. Now, if the EF is a preserved and you would calculate the stroke volume index, if it's compromised, then you wanna control their blood pressure and you wanna look for other etiologies. These patients, often they are women, older and have restricted cardiac filling and that's what's causing their stroke volume index to be compromised. You would wanna measure this when their blood pressure is well optimized, at least to remove the afterload mismatch from the high blood pressure. And that will give you a better indication about the severity. And you need also a disjunctive uh, modalities such as aortic valve calcium score, DVI and other modalities. Now, what if the patient is asymptomatic? Then if they have severe AS, but they're asymptomatic, but have a uh, compromised LV function, less than 50%, that stays C2, they need to go for aortic valve intervention. If they're undergoing cardiac surgery, you need to go for saver concomitant. These are both class one. Now, what if the patient is truly asymptomatic with normal LV function? Then if they're truly asymptomatic, severe C1 stage, you can put them on a treadmill and see if you can elicit symptoms or examine the hemodynamic and physiologic response. If they have limited functional capacity to sex, age, adjust, adjusted functional capacity, or they drop their blood pressure by more than 10 to 20 millimeter, then there's an indication for aortic valve intervention. And usually here it's SAVR because of the paucity of evidence for TAVI in severe asymptomatic patients. Now, if the patient is severe, truly severe asymptomatic and uh, have a preserved uh, LV function, but have very severe or critical AS defined as Vmax more than five meter per second or mean gradient more than 60, or they're truly asymptomatic, but have evidence of subclinical heart failure as evidenced by BMP more than three times normal, or they showed rapid disease progression. And we define that us and the European guidelines as more than 0.3 meter per second velocity increase per year. Usual progression is average is 0.3 meter per second velocity, seven to eight millimeter gradients and 0.15 centimeter square reduction in aortic valve area. Anything more than that, mostly more than 0.3 meter per second would indicate rapid disease progression once it's happening at a faster rate than this per year. Provided these patients are low surgical risk, these patients can undergo SAVR. So critical asymptomatic AS, subclinical heart failure, rapid progression, it's reasonable to go for SAVR if the surgical risk is low. Now, if the patient had moderate AS undergoing other cardiac surgery, it's a class 2B, maybe reasonable to undergo SAVR, and also it may be reasonable to undergo SAVR if they have progressive reduction in LV function despite severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis. And you need to use three serial studies to ascertain there's no error in readings. Even if the reduction happened and the patient is still within a normal range LV function, but it went, let's say, from 65 to 55% on three serial testing, it may be reasonable to uh, proceed with surgical aortic valve replacements. So these are the recommendations for uh, doing aortic valve interventions. Now, what about the choice of SAVR versus TAVI in these patients? And let's go back to that particular patient. So according to the ACCHA guidelines, the best therapeutic strategy of this 66-year-old man with severe symptomatic AS is choice of therapeutic strategy is dictated solely by the surgical risk as assessed by the surgeon and interventionist, balloon vivaloplasty for palliative reasons, SAVR with mechanical processes, TAVI or SAVR with bioprocesses. Let's dissect those. So first, the first answer is obviously wrong. Uh, you need to invoke the multidisciplinary heart valve team when intervention is considered. So cardiac surgeons, interventional cardiologists, possibly uh, the primary care physician of the patient, non-invasive cardiologist, uh, possibly geriatrician if needed. And you need in a multidisciplinary heart valve team fashion to determine uh, the risk benefit and alternatives that you think are reasonable for this patient. And then very importantly, obviously, the choice of the prosthetic valve and the choice of the therapeutic strategy should be done in a shared decision-making process 
with the patients. So we need to understand what are the values of the patients. Do they want an open heart surgery or they would want a percutaneous procedure? Do they want a prolonged hospital stay or an average of a two to three day mean length of stay with TAVI? We also want to understand their preferences. Are they okay with getting anticoagulation? As such, they would be okay with the mechanical procedures. If it's an absolute preference not to take anticoagulation, then your only choice is by prosthesis. Um, and then we need to uh, uh, also discuss the risk and indication for anticoagulant therapy, as well as very important, the durability of the valve. Mechanical prosthesis can last forever, technically, conceptually, while bioprocesses have more limited durability. And data for TAVR bioprocesses is even limited to five years of echocardiographic adjudicated data and maybe eight plus years of clinical data, while we have way more experience showing the durability of the surgical bioprocesses exceed 15, 20 years. Of course, it goes down with younger age groups, and we'll talk more about this. Uh, so evaluating with a heart valve team, shared decision with a patient, and objective risk scores are all class one indications, by the way, in our guidelines. Now, what about vivaloplasty? Uh, only in a critically ill patients, based on expert opinion, it may be reasonable to do aortic percutaneous aortic balloon dilatation as a bridge to aortic valve intervention, definitive intervention, like SAVR or TAVI. There's not much data. Alain Cribier, I put this picture because Alain Cribier in 1986 was the first to describe balloon aortic vivaloplasty, and he came back along with Dr. Panegua, my colleague at uh, Baylor and the VA, they both did the first retrograde and anti-grade percutaneous uh, aortic valve implantation. But Alain Cribier, even before the 2003, did the first balloon aortic valvuloplasty. At that time, it was deemed a miraculous treatment, uh, but we realized shortly after that there is no survival benefit. And the reason behind this, and also the symptoms improvement are only short-lived. And the reason behind this can be really uh, summarized in this meta-analysis done by Dr. Kumar and Dr. Panegua and Dr. and myself a few years back. We looked at all the literature published on balloon aortic valvuloplasty in the TAVR era, and we confirmed what has been known before is that you improve severe AS from very severe to moderate to severe or the less severe. So the improvement in mean gradients is uh, really uh, marginal goes from 50 to 25, and the improvement in aortic valve area goes from 0 0.6 to still less than one centimeter square. So the hemodynamic improvement, because of the nature of the senile cathetic aortic stenosis, uh, unlike mitral stenosis, rheumatic mitral stenosis, where it's commissural disease, there's a diffuse fibrosis and calcification of the aortic valve, but an aortic valve repetitive mechanism, which splits the commissure, does not act very well on aortic stenosis. That's different than congenital aortic stenosis in the young, obviously. And also, these uh, valves can re stenose and the symptoms recur within a few weeks to up to three months. That's why aortic valvuloplasty is not a definitive treatment for severe uh, calcific aortic stenosis. Now, whenever you consider the choice of TAVI versus SAVR, you want to factor many things. One is the age slash life expectancy. So you want to balance the patient longevity against the durability of the prostatic valve. So for example, very young patients, there's a signal of survival benefit when you use a very durable, durable mechanical aortic valve with surgery, because these can conceptually last for a long time and you don't need reoperation and you're not subject to the risk of structural valve deterioration the way uh, you have with bioprostatic aortic valve. Patient risk and comorbidities are very important, obviously you would wanna assess the risk score and we have objective risk scores. Uh, we use mostly STS risk scores to assess the surgical risk. TAVI risk score we don't use as much because TAVI risks are really very low. But with STS risk score, you differentiate into low, intermediate and high risk and even extreme risk, which is inoperable patients. And in those with heart, who are at high risk or inoperable risk, it does make sense to proceed with a less invasive approach like TAVI. And you want to assess frailty with any of the indices you have. You want to also assess other comorbidities that may not be incorporated into the risk scores. For example, with STS, uh, 
does not account for mediastinal radiation. And this patient in particular had mediastinal radiation in the past. Postural aorta is also not accounted for in the STS risk score. And both of those, for example, are uh, increase the risk of uh, surgical risk and make surgery uh, possibly prohibitive and make TAVI more attractive. You want to also account for anatomical and technical issues and procedure specific impediments. So anatomical consideration by cuspid aortic valve are less well studied in clinical trials and they are at higher risk of complications with TAVI. They're more calcified, more eccentric, so i.e. more PVL, although this has been going down with the newer generation TAVI platforms. And oftentimes they may have an aortic aneurysm, ascending aortic aneurysm or abnormalities. So that makes TAVI more problematic and more tricky and sovereign these patients is preferable. Procedural consideration, if you've got peripheral arterial disease, unable to perform transfemoral approach TAVI, then it's preferable to go with SAVR. Remember, most of the randomized clinical trials and our guidelines are really based on data from RCT for transfemoral TAVI. Alternate access TAVI has been shown promise and effectiveness and safety in multiple non-randomized trials, but did not make it yet to the guidelines. The European guidelines have a soft indication for performing alternate access TAVI, but not the American guidelines. Another procedural consideration, for example, low coronary ostia, uh, uh, distance from the uh, aortic analysis of, let's say, uh, six or seven millimeter may subject these patients to occlusion of the coronary ostia during a TAVI when you do the implantation of the valve, and as such, uh, SAVR would be preferable in these patients. You also want to account for the goals of care and the patient preferences and values, including the preferences and values for prosthesis and for anticoagulation. And finally, indications for aortic valve intervention. Remember, the randomized control trials for TAVI, and most of the evidence is derived or based on this patient with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. For those with asymptomatic aortic stenosis, there's a positive of evidence supporting the use of TAVI. Now, it does make sense that it may be beneficial, but we're waiting for the evidence. While we have decades of experience with uh, SAVR uh, for symptomatic and asymptomatic aortic stenosis, such as those going for cardiac surgery, and also there's some data showing that it's reasonable to proceed with SAVR, even with severe asymptomatic, at least two surgical trials showing benefit. Small scale studies, but showing benefit. So that's why an asymptomatic patient with severe AS, SAVR may be the way to go for the time being. Obviously, this is a very dynamic field and we are awaiting for more evidence and more data. So let's go for the crux of the, uh, uh, of the topic or the most important part of the uh, grand rounds. And this is geared towards the clinical cardiologist, but also the interventional cardiologist. So for severe AS, when to choose TAVI versus SAVR. By the way, you see me using TAVI and TAVR interchangeably. As of December 2020, our guidelines, we are catching up with our European colleagues and we are now phasing out the TAVR term and we're using TAVI, it's a transcastle aortic valve implantation. So whenever you have an indication for aortic valve intervention, you wanna invoke the patient in a shared decision-making as well as the heart valve team, you wanna determine the surgical risk. And according to the surgical risk, you wanna dichotomize these patients into either high or prohibitive risk defined by an STS more than 8%, frailty and multi-organ dysfunction, or if they have procedural impediments like mediastinal radiation or uh, portion aorta. So these high or prohibitive risk are in one category. And then the other category are not high or prohibitive risk, i.e. low or moderate risk. So if the patient have an indication for aortic valve replacement and after shared decision making with the patient and deliberation by the heart valve team, if the patient is low to moderate risk, you'd wanna ask this important question. Is the patient is amenable for vitamin K antagonist anticoagulation. Can he or she take Coumadin or Warfarin? If the answer is yes, then you would wanna see what's the age of this patient. If the patient is below 50 years of age, SAVR with a mechanical prosthesis is the way to go because of the durability of the mechanical prosthesis with SAVR. In very comprehensive valve centers, 
in patient-critic anticoagulation, you can entertain ROS procedure, although durability and aortic regurgitation with the new aortic valve and complexity of the procedure may make it really only limited to certain centers. So it may be a reasonable approach, but mostly mechanical aortic valve. Some meta-analysis show that there may be survival benefits from using mechanical processes with SAVR in younger patients. These patients can take anticoagulation with minimal risk, and these patients needs the long-term durability of a mechanical process. Now, above 65 years of age, bioprocesses is the way to go, because with bioprocesses, it's likely that the patients will outlive the bioprocesses so that durability is not an issue. And also at above age 65, the risk of bleeding with anticoagulation becomes more bigger and bigger and more problematic. Between 65 and 50, mechanical or bioprostatic valve with SAVR is the way to go because even bioprostatic SAVR has more data for durability compared to a TAVI bioprosthesis. Now, what if the patient is not amenable to vitamin K anticoagulants, i.e. this patient will be destined for a bioprostatic aortic valve? Or if the patient is above 65 and already destined to bioprosthesis, or patient is younger, but really doesn't want to take a mechanical valve. So bioprosthesis. Once you have a bioprosthesis determined as a treatment strategy, the next question is what stage of aortic stenosis does this patient have? If the patient have a stage C2, so anything outside D1, D2, D3, uh, or C2, they would go for SAVR. So stage C1, they go for SAVR. But stage D1, D2, D3, or C2. So the majority of severe symptomatic AS who are getting bioprosthesis could go the route of either TAVR or SAVR, depending again on age. So if they're above eight years of age, the American guidelines say transfemoral TAVI, provided they're suitable for transfemoral TAVI, is recommended as a class one indication because the durability of the uh, bioprosthesis with TAVI. Uh, is uh, uh, long enough to likely outlive the age of the patients. And the risk of SAVR in this age group is much more pronounced than the risk of TF TAVI. So class one recommendation for transfemoral TAVI, it's reasonable to do SAVR in lower risk patients. But in general, above eight years of age, transfemoral TAVI is recommended. Now below 65 years of age, SAVR is recommended with bioprocesses. Uh, and between 65 and 80 years of age, this is where you need really a good discussion with the patients and understand the value and the preference of the patients. And you could go either with SAVR or TF TAVI. Now, this is the, Europe, the American guidelines, and these are quite different than the European guidelines. Our European colleagues, and I will go over this in a minute, instead of going with this granularity of age cutoffs, 65, 80, and 65 to 80, they went with a dichotomy of 75 above and below, in addition to risk. Here we're factoring the anticoagulation, the surgical risk, the, and the age of the patient. So we believe we have a little bit more granularity in our decision-making for TAVI versus SAVR. Now, what about these patients in the American guidelines who have indication for aortic valve intervention? and have a surgical risk that's high or prohibited. So the question is, do they have a life expectancy that's more than one quality of life year? And if the answer is yes, and they have suitable valve anatomy and suitable peripheral anatomy for transfemoral approach, then they should go with TAVI. If they have limited quality of life, less than one year, quality of life expectancy, if they're not suitable for transfemoral TAVI or have very, very calcific bicuspid severe aortic stenosis that make it very, uh, uh, high risk, then maybe palliative care is the way to go. Now, that's the guidelines, because remember, we do not have alternate access in the guideline as a therapeutic approach. Our European colleagues do say that you may consider doing alternate access in selected patients. And if you have poor life expectancy, obviously, palliative care is the way to go. So again, in the American guidelines, the choices of intervention start initially with determining in a shared decision-making with the patient whether the patient should receive mechanical versus bioprostatic aortic valve. 
below 50 years of age, mechanical, aortic valve is the way to go. Above 65 years of age, you can use bioprocesses better in reasonable to use bioprocesses in preference to a mechanical valve between 50 and 65, either way, depending on the patient's anticoagulation risk and preference and values. Once you determine you, the patient wanna and is eligible to get a bioprocesses, then again, you go with the age cutoffs and the life expectancy. Below 65 years of age or a life expectancy more than 20 years, several of the bioprocesses is the way to go because of its durability. Above eight years of age or a life expectancy less than 10 years, then transfemoral therapy is the way to go because of its safety and because the patient is likely to outlive the TAVI bioprocesses. Between 65 and 80 years of age, either SAVR or transfemoral TAVI is recommended. Now, again, remember that there are procedure-specific risk factors that are not factored in in the TAVI risk scores and in the STS risk scores, such as medicinal radiation, aortic calcification, the extent of severity of COPD, uh, RV dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction, all these are not factored in, in the STS risk scores and they need to be added on in your risk assessment. So these objective risk scores are not really, uh, are not gospel. You need to add the clinical Gunstadt to it. And um, also remember that most of these randomized clinical trials were really are clinical efficacy studies based on uh, the very well appropriately selected patients. Now, patients with end stage disease, with COPD, with hepatic, uh, advanced hepatic disease were excluded in these trials. But we have retrospective analysis and observational data showing that TAVI may be an acceptable alternative in these patients. This is one such analysis from administrative data that Dr. El Badawi, one of our interventional fellows, along with Dr. Kapadia, chair at the clinical clinic, did with myself and many of my colleagues at Baylor. What we showed is patients with a prior medicinal radiation there's an increase in the use of TAVI over time, while the use of SAVR plateaued. And even after multivariable adjustment, of course, these are confounded data because of the administrative data, but with the best multivariable adjustment models, we show that there's a signal of mortality benefit doing TAVI over SAVR, although these are non-randomized studies. This is just one example of these observational studies that showed the benefit of TAVI in patients especially patient population that were not included in the guidelines. This is an example of patients with a prior medicinal radiation, but we have data in end disease, in patients with liver dysfunction, uh, probably not advanced liver dysfunction, and uh, patients with even bicuspid aortic valve, some retrospective and observational analysis showing the benefits and the merits of TAVI in these patients. Now, I wanna remind you, I wanna remind you of the current outcomes contemporary outcomes of TAVI. So in the discussion with the patient, when you wanna invoke the patient in a shared decision-making, you would wanna tell the patient that 30-day mortality in TAVI has come along quite a bit from five to 6% at 30 days in the early experience to now 2.3%. So it's a ratio of 2% mortality, and it's even lower in the clinical trials. Stroke rates coming down, uh, in hospital from 2.2% to 1.6% and 2.8% to 2.3% at 30 days. Pacemaker rates as well coming down to nearly the single digit, now 8% to 10% in hospital versus 30 day. So, and depending obviously on the TAVI platform, but outcomes are improving over time. Part of it because of technical improvements, because of TAVI platform improvements, but also importantly, uh, because now and we're doing more and more lower risk patients. Remember the initial uh, approval in 2011 in November, uh, when we started the first TAVI was for inoperable patients based on partner B, a cohort of 300 patients showing survival benefit of 20% of TAVI over medical therapy. Then we had the high risk indication a year after. In 2016, we have the intermediate risk indication and low risk in patients in the low 70s, 72, 73, showing low risk benefits with TAVI compared to SAVR in 2019. And this is when the low risk FDA label came in. And based on this also, we uh, in large extent updated the guideline. So we're doing more 
uh, and more TAVR or TAVI uh, procedures in low risk patients. And the contemporary uh, data for aortic, isolated aortic valve surgery showed a mortality rate of uh, operative of 2.2%. But you add cabbage width, it goes to 4%. You add double valve replacements, then it's nearly uh, 10%. Now, paravalvular leak after TAVI remains uh, a, a limitation of uh, TAVI, but it's less so with the current generation uh, TAVI platforms. Dr. Dhruv Mata, one of our uh, uh, cardiology fellows, wrote this editorial and emphasized that really PVL now with the newer platforms, when it's, it's approaching zero for moderate or severe PVL. So this paravalvular leak uh, uh, limitation is being overcome with the better platforms. And also, there's always this question is, when you go for surgery, you can fix both valves and there's a mitral valve disease. But if you go with TAVI, uh, you're only limited to the aortic valve and you may need to go for a second approach. And there are some data to show that this may be the case in a fraction of the patient, but a lot of these patients, if they have concomitant severe AS and severe MR, once you fix their aortic valve with a TAVI, what you do is you decrease their LV and systolic pressure and you decrease uh, their mitral regurg and with the help of guideline directed medical optimization therapy, you do not need a subsequent transcatheter aortic mitral intervention. So that's why in the guideline we shed away from stating that you should do concomitant percutaneous valve procedures. You fix the TAVI, the, the aortic valve with the TAVI and then you reassess and optimize and do assess the need for a TER, a mitral clip, or other mitral valve intervention later on. And this is something we outlined in a nice editorial with uh, your own Dr. Plana and uh, our brilliant fellow Dr. Jean Sufredi in this editorial. By cuspid aortic valve, uh, there are no randomized controlled data. There's good retrospective observational analysis showing that it's effective and safe and selected patient to do TAVI. However, you would want to do them really in a comprehensive valve center. And it's maybe reasonable to do them. Preferably, it's always uh, preferable to proceed with SAVR as a first option. One, these patients are young. They may need anyway a mechanical prosthesis. Two, they have high calcium score. They may be more prone, small signal of increased embolic stroke. Uh, they have eccentric annuli, they may have more paravalvular leak, although admittedly this may be slightly overcome in the current era with the better TAVI platforms, but there's certainly more risk in these patients. So that's why SAVR is preferable and maybe reasonable at selected centers, comprehensive valve centers to do a bicuspid aortic valve TAVIs. And Dr. Kayani, uh, one of our faculty members, wrote a very nice editorial at the Clinical Clinic Journal on this regard. Let's go back to the case of the patients I just presented to you. Remember, I told you he had two surgeries. So one of the surgeries was cabbage, and you could see that he has a rima, a pedicle rima to the uh, LED, and this rima is adherent to the mediastinum, and we confirmed this in our lateral view. So doing re do open heart surgery may risk injuring this rima. So that's one, that's why surgery is prohibitive. And again, this is not accounted for in the STS score. In addition to that, this gentleman had mediastinal radiation. Another unaccounted for risk, despite his young age, this guy is at a very high surgical risk for redo, redo surgery. Now, what I want you to uh, pay attention to is this ring over here. Remember the apex of the left ventricle? This is a patient we performed a TAVI on in 2012, our early experience. This is a pigtail. In the left ventricle, we're doing an LV gram, injecting a, um, a radio aerodinated radio contrast material in the LV gram, and you see the uh, opacification of this conduit that's going from the left ventricle all the way to the aorta to decompress the severe AS uh, uh, in this patients. So this patient had earlier cabbage and midas radiation. He had a progression of his aortic stenosis. He is no longer eligible for SAVR. TAVI was not an option at that time. So he had one of the infrequent uh, surgeries to, decom to relieve the aortic valve obstruction, which is a conduit, a valved conduit from the left ventricle to the aorta. And there was a valve here uh, that's uh, uh, it's a metronic valve 
Uh, now, this patient, a few years afterwards, came in with symptoms of aortic stenosis again. And the question is, what happened to this conduit? Does he have obstruction or stenosis of the valve inside the conduit, or there's any conduit problem? So that's why we're injecting dye to assess this conduit. We don't see any layering thrombus. These usually don't really form layering thrombus, but we don't see anything gross with this injection. After that, we went through the aorta retrogradely and took us some time to find the ostium of the anastomosis of the aorta with the conduit. We catheterized it after we found it. We put a wire there and over the wire, we advanced our catheter. We injected dye to check for any obstruction at the level of the conduit. And also beforehand, we did a gradient between the left ventricle and the conduit distal to the valve, and there was no gradient at this level. So really, the valve inside the conduit was not the stenotic culprit. And then we did a pullback, and you could see that there's a hint of anastomosis problem at the anastomosis between the conduit and the aorta. So the conduit was non-functional, or the conduit is imparting a functional aortic stenosis, but it was at the level of the anastomosis. So here was the choice. Should we balloon, risky balloon, the anastomosis, the stenotic anastomosis between the aorta and the conduit, or should we proceed with the newly available transfemoral TAVI? And that's what we did at that time in 2012, mid-2012. This is the early generation Edward Sapien TAVI platform. I forgot whether it was 26 or 20, 26 millimeter probably valve. There wasn't uh, 29 at that time, if I recollect. And you see the integrity of this aortic valve. There's no aortic regurgitation or a parvular leak upon doing an ascending aorta, aorta angiogram. And this was done obviously under RBP pacing with top of a pacemaker, a nicely deployed Edward Sapien valve. I continue to follow this patient to now and he's doing very, very well. Came in later, by the way, with a non-ST elevation MI and I had to interview on his vein grafts. And I was so happy that I put a short TAVI platform, the balloon expandable platform, because that allowed me easier access to his Cori uh, ostium. Actually, it was a vein graft intervention. So Cori ostium access was not an issue in this patient. And this is his hemodynamics before the TAVI. You see the uh, delayed and diminished aortic, uh, uh, systolic aortic pressure. This coincides with his parvus retardus carotid pulse, large gradients, elevated LVDP as well. And then post transfemoral TAVI, you see now your appearance of the dichrotic notch, and uh, there is no uh, uh, diminished uh, or uh, uh, delayed pulse and nearly superimposable curves with a very, very minimal gradient of two to three millimeter. So before I uh, finish the topic, I just want to tell you that the European guidelines were published probably three months, two to three months ago. For the most part, they have similar guideline recommendations to us, with the exception, instead of using the cutoffs of 65 and 80, three groups, they use the cutoff of 75, one cutoff. So above 75 or high risk, patients would go with transfemoral TAVI, according to the ESC European guidelines. Below 75 and low risk, you go for SAVR. Now, any other patients would go to either SAVR or TAVI. For example, patients below 75, but are moderate risk, they could go either TAVI or SAVR. But above 75, it's strong preference, class one for TAVR, and high risk or above class one for TAVR. To go for SAVR, you need below 75 years of age and low risk to go automatically for SAVR. So really, the European guidelines lower the threshold for the utilization or implementation of TAV in AS patients. Now, the reason we did not do that, and we went with more, we think our approach is more granular because uh, it's, uh, it's basically more granular. It allows more choices for the practicing physicians. That's one. And remember, these are only guiding documents. Uh, and two, with the low-risk patients, 
we really have one to two year data fallout. Now, actually, we have uh, 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 more data accumulating intermediate uh, term data, but still we're lacking the long term data for the durability of the IR TAVI biopsies, especially in younger patients. And the partner three trials uh, are really uh, uh, mandated to continue for to report their 10 year outcomes. So we will know in many years from now uh, what's the long term outcomes of TAVI in low risk patients. Uh, so I want to end by reminding you that heart team approach, objective risk assessment uh, of SAVI risk and TAVI risk, as well as shared decision making with the patient, are key. Uh, recommendation, the guideline, and you want to factor everything in your assessment of the patient's uh, treatments and the choice of treatments, including age, comorbidities, freight leave, life expectancy, as well as anatomical and procedural considerations. Uh, with this, I want to end and thank you all uh, for uh, your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you have.